Am I recording? Good evening all and welcome to another BITA platform. Uh, today again we have Mark Mokler giving us the latest update in I suppose a pivotal week uh, in terms of what's happening with COVID-19. We're about to hear uh, some updates in terms of what's happening today and yesterday as a result of uh, Boris Johnson's uh, announcement on Sunday night. So, uh, Martin, um, what is the latest status? Well, yeah, as you said, another week, and it's only Tuesday. It feels like another week, but another two working days and a lot, a lot of new developments. Um, nothing brand new from a, from a Treasury and a finance point of view, but lots of tweaks and changes, and uh, most are very interesting. Again, the, the, the sort of messages that the uh, government are uh, learning as they go, the finding out what's working, what's not working, uh, and amending the supports and initiatives accordingly. So, um, yeah, we're happy to field any questions. I won't stray into any political uh, answers. Um, won't deal with the, uh, the, the lockdown restrictions, which um, may or may not be eased over the next few months, but um, happy to, to field any, uh, any questions in relation to the funding supports, tax-related, furlough, etc. But can you just, you know, the most important question, I suppose, that's on everybody's list is, when is the golf course opening? Yeah, um, I can tell you when it's opening in Ireland, if that helps. <laughs> um, I'll start, I have a few uh, questions um, following on, I suppose, from subsequent weeks. Um, um, and I suppose the first question is, I've heard the furlough scheme is being extended. Uh, is there any more details on this now, please? Yeah, <clears throat> so this is pretty much hot off the press. Um, Rishi Sunak, who's playing a blinder in fairness to him, stood up in the House of Commons again today and um, detailed the, the changes to the scheme. So I, I won't go into the, the, uh, the mechanics of the scheme. I'm sure everyone's fully aware of how it works, but the, the big changes today is that it's formally been extended now to the end of October. So you probably were aware it, 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 it uh, originated from the 1st of March, the end of May, it was extended to the end of June a couple of weeks ago, and now it's official, it's around the end of uh, October. So, however, there's a sting in the tail for the employers. We don't have detail yet, and we won't have it until the end of this month, but from August, employers are going to have to contribute in some shape or form to this scheme. Now, I can surmise that that would probably look like uh, the employees still getting the 80%, but the employer is contributing 20 or 40 percent or perhaps it's tapered over the months August through October we, we don't know but um, it's certainly what we do know is that the burden will be shared from August onwards. Uh, a remarkable scheme nothing like it in par unparalleled nothing like it in economic history uh, hard to believe it's on a Tory government watch um, it, it feels like a labour scheme but um, yeah so that's the position what we do also know is that employees from August can come back on a part-time basis. Now this is sensible because uh, under the current rules, if you bring an employee back even for a, a half a day, that invalidates your furlough period and you can't claim for any of those three weeks. So that's a sensible change. Again, trigger date is August um, and, and that satisfies, I think, the, the businesses who will gradually have a requirement for additional HR resources and can take them back over a period of time. Again, we don't yet know what that will look like in terms of uh, maybe a reduced furlough grant, but um, that's the position and we will know more by the end of the month. I mentioned earlier it's a remarkable scheme. At the moment, one in four British workers are furloughed. So I'll say it again, one in four are furloughed. That's 7.5 million people. When you add that to the uh, people who are employed by the state, so the civil service, the armed forces, 50% of the working population of the UK are now being paid by the government. Um, just off, off the charts. So that's costing the Treasury £10 billion a month, which is the same as the NHS budget. So clearly this can only go on for a, 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 a relatively short period of time. We don't see it uh, being extended past October. Um, but as I said, it'll be tapered from August, and we'll we'll know more uh, we'll know more soon. I think that the, the real concern here is that businesses who have been operational during this lockdown period have had to get lean and mean pretty quickly. And the you know, and I'm not saying this is a 
has been a, a purposeful approach, but they, they've realized that they're probably carrying an element of dead wood. So the HR departments of a lot of the sort of middle-sized employers are dusting off the redundancy protocols because it's highly likely when the scheme does end, there will be redundancies. I know that's not what the Chancellor wants, but it, it's, it's a racing certainty that not everybody will come back off this scheme. So, um, yeah, I hope that answers that question. So in terms of the economics, I mean, you know, the fact that it's gone out to October is, you know, should we be worried, more worried than we were already worried about, you know, is that a giveaway, the fact that it's extended out to October, that we are not yet seeing uh, the extent of this economic crisis yet? Well, I think it, it, it demonstrates that the, the Treasury are expecting a very soft summer uh, and, and early autumn in terms of economic activity. I, I've mentioned before that UK PLC is like a, a very complicated, highly tuned machine. And you pull the power cord out uh, in, in the middle of March and press the green button sometime in, in June or July, <clears throat> that machine will not come back to full capacity quickly and there'll be lots of broken parts. So I, I think you're right. It, it does indicate that um, the Treasury and the Chancellor expect there to be pain in, in, the, um, in the employment sector. What we haven't seen here is unemployment numbers, uh, anything like uh, that's happened in the US because of the furlough scheme. So in, in the US, you've, uh, you know, again, some eye-watering numbers, 20 million people unemployed in the month of April. Um, that hasn't happened in the UK, but, you know, the taxpayers are paying a price to avoid that calamity. But yeah, look, at it. Paul, everyone's feeling the way. They, they really, it's, it's, a, it's crystal ball gazing to a degree. You can see by the tone of Boris Johnson, he, I would call him a shook man. He, he, he's not the same guy he was two months ago. Uh, he's in the, in the, in the Dove uh, team in, in, the, uh, in the cabinet. There's a split in the cabinet as to, um, as to what the approach is. The Hawks want to take the Donald Trump approach and just let everyone back out. And Boris, Hancock and, 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 and those guys are saying, no, this is the steady as she goes. Um, so really the debate is, lives or livelihoods and, and that's what it comes down to so they're trying to walk that tightrope and and try and keep uk plc operational so yeah really don't know paul okay in terms of just before we leave furlough um just to give us clarity on that so we have uh, examples of um, employees who've taken up the furlough scheme so um could we just reiterate that extends to the end of june and then what happens after the end of june so at, at the moment, the, the furlough scheme has a, has a new deadline at the end of October, but furlough periods are three-week rolling periods. So you furlough somebody and they have to be furloughed for three full weeks to enable you to receive the furlough grant. So from the date you furlough them, you, you, you calculate a three-week period and, and that grant's payable. So you can furlough somebody from today, three weeks later, as long as you apply, obviously you get the grant from HMRC. You can take them back off furlough at the end of three weeks. They can work for a week or two weeks, and then you can put them back on furlough again. So any time between now and the end of October, the furlough scheme is operational, and the grant will be paid for a full three-week furlough period. Again, what we don't know is from August onwards, whether that three-week period will be changed, whether, you know, what, what the, the, the sort of terms and conditions will look like. But at the moment, certainly to the end of July, Three week furlough periods get full payment from HMRC. Okay. Another question I want to purchase new plant for a HS2 related contract. So, can I use any of the government support to do so? That's a very interesting question. And I must say, I'm, I'm fascinated at what's happening in this sector and in the civil sector supporting this large infrastructure project. So, you've probably seen that the notice to proceed was formally issued by the government about three weeks ago now. There's an initial, an initial spend of 12 billion um, for HS2. It's split between four joint venture consortiums and those contracts are trickling down to mid-size and small-size civil engineering companies primarily. So we have seen um, some remarkable um, opportunities in this sector. For example, Hitachi Capital and JCB Credit have both been accredited by the British Business Bank as Sybil's lenders. So what that means is, and we have a client who's in the middle of, of a transaction uh, that I'm going to walk through now. 
you're probably familiar, SIBLS means that the government will offer an 80% guarantee to a lender who's supporting a business. The government will pay the first year's interest and it will pay any arrangement fees. So I have a working example with JCB Credit where they have offered finance to a client of ours for three large machines, track machines, costing three quarters of a million pounds. You're, you may or may not be familiar with HP agreements, but the interest is, is loaded to the first few years. So the year one interest is the highest interest. There's a calculation called the sum of digits, which I won't bore anyone with at the moment. But essentially, the interest in year one is, is the largest amount of interest. Under the Sybil's loan, the government will pick up this interest in year one. We have a client who's going to save 30 grand in loan interest because the government are paying um, the first 12 months interest. Now, the, the caveat is that you can't avail of any other government supports. So you can't have a Sybil's loan or, or anything of that nature. But if you're a company, that is embarking on contracts in the sector and you don't need a Sybil's loan, but you want to expand the business to buy some plant, then JCB Credit and Hitachi Capital are accredited lenders and are willing to offer debt under the Sybil scheme. R like, r remarkable. Um, and just sort of following on from that, I also see that um, Assets Capital, West One and Oak North, who are three specialist lenders to the property development sector, They've also been accredited under the scheme. Now we have clients who are talking to them, property developers who are talking to them about drawing down funding. So you know, people think that, that Sybils is, is um, targeted at, at high street banks. They've really broadened the net. Anybody who provides finance in the UK and can get accredited, Funding Circle, another good example, Funding Circle are throwing money at the door under Sybils um, and they're under, underwriting criteria, which was, it's fair to say, much, lighter touch than, than the high street banks have adopted the same approach under under Sybils and, and um you know and, and they're sort of grabbing some market share what that would look like in a year or two years time i, I don't know whether there'll be a much higher debt impairment figure but um but yeah so that the, the Sybils uh, is a wide ranging facility and would apply to somebody who, who's buying new plant Okay, and staying on the Sybils, um, my bank has refused a 100,000 Sybils loan application on the basis that my management information is inf insufficient and they won't tell me what to provide. <laughs> it's probably Barclays or Metro Bank, perhaps, yeah. Um, <laughs> you did, we didn't say that. I wanted to leave that anyway, straight away. <laughs> we edit that. Um, look, it, it's, it's tricky because a lot of this depends on the relationship manager you're dealing with. If you've got a junior uh, individual who's your point of contact and they're, you know, they're, 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 they're not experienced in, in, in commercial lending, then um, we've got plenty of examples of, of clients who are struggling to, um, to produce the right information. Now, the, 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 you can go to the British, the British Business Bank website and it'll give you the, the, the general eligibility and criteria. But the, the really important stuff um, to be aware is that you have to provide the information as tidy and as neat with a little pink bow on top and make it as easy as possible for the bank to um, sanction this because the, the mechanics of it are the relationship manager gets the, the application, he tops and tails it, he writes up his credit paper. If it's a large application, he'll bring in a credit analyst, but eventually it'll go to a credit committee. So you don't want these guys having to struggle to work their way through um, information. So, I'm just, for the avoidance of any doubt, again, we've, all, we've been over the civil scheme lots of times, but just, I will walk through briefly to remind people that if the loan is less than 250 grand, there's no personal guarantee required. If it's above 250 grand, banks may ask for personal guarantee. Lawyers are an exception, they're, they're not. But um, that guarantee is limited to 20% of the debt and your personal private residence, your principal private residence can't be included in that personal guarantee. So individuals are only exposed to 20% of the debt and that can't extend to your, to your, your main home. Okay. Um, in terms of um, uh, the bounce back loan, uh, how does that work? Right. The bounce back loan is the closest thing that the UK will ever see to helicopter money. It's, um, it's remarkable. It's a self-certification process. You apply online, there is no human interaction. 
the government have standardized the form. The main lenders are now accredited, so Lloyds, Barclays, HSBC. I spoke to a senior Metro Bank um, director about an hour ago, and Metro are expecting accreditation this week. They have their software systems ready to go. So what happens is the, the business owner applies online, so a sole trader, partner, director of a limited company, they ask, so they answer about a dozen questions, and the focus is, are you solvent? What was your turnover in 2019? Do you expect that you will remain solvent? And um, are you a UK resident? And really, it's not much more than that. And the bank aren't cross-checking this information. I have working examples of applications that have gone in where people have um, made an error in their 2019 turnover figure and um, ended up with a higher loan. Um, there is a cap. So the cap is if your turnover is more than 200 grand, then your loan value is capped at 50 grand. So it's targeted at small businesses. But what it is doing is pushing money down the pipe remarkably quickly. The first day it was, an, it was released, which was last Monday week, Lloyds Bank approved a billion pounds on Monday and it was paid on Tuesday. That, that is just off the charts. So that'll just show you the, the, um, the, the, the take up. Because the problem with Sybils is it is a process and it's a painful process. And I just go back to Sybils. I didn't just complete the, the, uh, the, the answer I wanted to, to, to walk through in relation to Sybils. The important criteria for Sybils is that you have to demonstrate serviceability of the debt. And, and that's where most businesses are falling down. They're not showing the bank that with this new loan, even though it might be over six years, they, they can afford to make those repayments. So you, you generally would ask for a capital holiday in the first six months of the loan. You can extend it to 12 months, but you have to be able to demonstrate to the bank that with this new debt on your balance sheet, that the profits, historic profits and future profits will, will enable those, that debt to be repaid. And that's where most businesses are falling down. They're looking at the current profit streams, they're producing cash flows, but the cash flows um, don't make sense because they, they can't justify the debt. So that, really, that, you know, we can see, um, and the problem is the pipe is clogged up because the bank either asks for a lot more information to try and justify the application or they refuse it. And then if they refuse it, there's an appeal process, which is, it's not great. Um, so the, the, the Sybil's facility, if, if the package of information is presented well, it's, it's easy. If, it's, if, if you go in half cocked, uh, excuse the French, you, you just, it, you'll struggle because the bank will either be rejected at the relationship manager level or it'll get pushed back by credit committee. So really important to, to make sure your package information is, is accurate and demonstrates serviceability. Okay, and going back to your comment about the helicopters, you know, obviously, you know, all of this is going to have to be paid for somewhere. Where does Martin see the government recovering this money? Will there be increases in corporation tax, income tax, VAT, uh, cuts in public services? Where do you see this coming back? Well, when Rishi Sunak first discussed the, uh, or introduced the word furlough to, um, <clears throat> to the English terminology, he said in that speech that um, they'd have to look very closely at the self-employed and the, the difference between the tax burden on the self-employed compared to the PEYE worker. Now, that may have been an off-the-cuff remark. Um, he was possibly alluding to the IR35 review, which should have gone live on, on, the, uh, on the 6th of April. It's now put back by a year. Um, so I, I'm not sure there was, there was any great thought or planning related to that, but he did allude to, to, to that as a, as a, as a um, source of future revenue. The reality is the numbers the Treasury are borrowing now and will borrow over, over the summer and toward the end of this year are significantly higher than they ever thought they'd have to borrow when, when they start to announce these initiatives and these supports. So I think the answer, Paul, is your kids is actually who will end up probably paying a lot of this because there's too much there's too much debt come onto the the, uh, the UK PLC balance sheet so they will probably issue some form of perpetual bonds and they'll crank up the printing presses in the Bank of England because these these numbers are they're, they're, they're the largest not just peacetime 
but the largest wartime money ever, ever uh, advanced into into uh, into the society. So, the, the, and it just go, it goes back to your point about is is this a is this an indication they know something we don't know? They know that if they don't push money down the pipe and keep people um, in employment or in in a in a coma that looks like employment, then the, you know the, the the consequences are disastrous. So I don't think this additional debt burden will be paid in this generation. I think some of it will be, and I think you may get tax rises, you, you, you probably will. I think the reality is it's, 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 a, it's a future generation will pay this. Okay, and in terms of the, um, how is Martin seeing the construction at the moment? Where is it the prices are being um, cut badly? Yeah, I mentioned the last day, I think we, we talked about it offline as well, that construction is normally sort of <clears throat> first in and first out of most recessions. This time around, it's sort of last in and, and certainly first out. And really, there was there was probably a lot of activity taking place during the, the main lockdown period. I think there will be price pressure. Um, it's not yet evidenced. I, we've plenty of examples of, of contracts being tendered at existing um, rates. The, the, the concern, I suppose, is probably on, there's two big concerns. One is the supply chain for materials. They're badly disrupted. Um, a lot of materials come from Italy, a lot come from China. Um, they're only just getting going again. That's probably going to feed through to some form of inflation in the material sector. Now, we had a lot of inflation in 2016, 2017, um, immediately after Brexit, when sterling fell dramatically. But that actually did get washed out after about an 18-month period. So even if there is inflation in, in the material sector, that, that may, um, you know, once that burden is, is, is born for a year, year and a half, that might be okay. I think labor is, is the other area of concern. There was a, a serious skills shortage in the construction sector in any event before this. What will happen going forward? I think a lot of the medium-sized contractors are hoping that they can um, perhaps increase the margins to some degree because they may be able to reduce um, sort of daily rates of pay. The, 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 the real threat here for, for, for contractors is the inefficiencies that are going to arise because of social distancing on sites. And there's a huge battle that has yet to be fought. So what happens if you have, we, we, we talked about this last week, if you've got a contract where you're supposed to supply 80 men per week and you're told that the site can only allow 30 men on, on at any point in time, and who picks up the cost of that extra working? And there's no clear answer yet. And I think that, that's, that's the risk. Um, cash is king in, in, in all these scenarios. Um, and contractors will, will, you know, the large PLC contractors will do what they always do, try and bully their, their supply chain and, and try and, you know, their margins weren't great before COVID-19. So they'll be trying to stay afloat themselves. So I think there'll be enough work around, Paul, but I think there's going to be battles in, in, in trying to preserve margin, and, 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 that, and that's the concern going forward. Okay. Another question, we're surviving um, from a cash flow perspective, apart from not being able to afford the monthly HMRC uh, payments. Uh, we have a large VAT liability due on the 7th of June, so um, what would you do? Okay, so if it's the 7th of June, as opposed to the 10th of June, then they're making the payment themselves. So there's an automatic VAT deferral, so they don't need to be concerned because if they pay VAT and it's due between the 20th of March and the end of June, then that VAT is not due. It gets rolled over and it's payable on the 31st of, or before the 31st of March, 2021. Again, I've made this point here, but it's worth mentioning it. If they pay their VAT by direct debit, it'll be payable on the 10th of June, and that direct debit will come out of the bank account. So for VAT, automatic deferral, um, no need to do anything if you pay your VAT normally, don't pay it, roll it up, pay it sometime between now and the end of March next year. If it's PAY and CAS that's causing uh, a cash flow problem, then very simple, they just need to phone the COVID hotline within HMRC, agree a time to pay arrangement. Um, those are being agreed um, over the phone in a very short order and HMRC are just asking everyone to call back at the end of June. So um, there's a, a well-worn path there. So really, again, going back to my last point about cash is king, you shouldn't, if you, if you can't afford to pay HMRC, don't, don't, don't pay HMRC. Conserve the cash and let's just see what, what 
what world we're living in in two or three months' time, and then decide what your 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 cash will allow. Uh, Dermot sent me a question there. This is more of an economic worry than a, a question, and normally Dermot's questions are quite loaded, so I'm going to read this quite carefully. Um, this is more of an economic worry than a, a question from Dermot. Prices are dropping from contracts, so it makes no sense if material prices are rising. Um, add on productive working, uh, as he says. And that's the, that's the problem. That's the double whammy that you may end up getting squeezed. Your margin disappears because your, your cost of sales, your, your, your labor and your material costs go up. Uh, inefficiencies due to drive the labor cost and your inflation drives the material cost. And either your contract has no, as most don't, has no ability to uplift the, uh, the contract value. So, you, you know, you have to pick up the pieces. So anybody who has signed a long-term contract to be pre-COVID and they have to complete on that over this year or into early 2021, that's a problem. And I don't see any easy solution here. It, it you know, will, will lead to cash flow problems and ultimately potentially some, some, some liquidations because who's going to pick up the pieces? The ultimate client? Unlikely. The, the main contractor? Highly unlikely. So that, that's, a, that's a concern. Um, I, I, like all these things, to a degree, it's, it, it's going to be the survival of the fittest. If you go back to the Great Recession, any small companies or companies without enough meat on the bone who were, were, were just, you know, struggling to get by, a lot of those guys, you know, really are no longer operational. But people who have good operations, run a good business, um, you know, they survived and a lot of them grew stronger. So what will happen this time, we don't know. Uh, the biggest concern is the shrinking margin, and, and you know if, if if you're locked into a long-term contract, that that's a problem. So, Dermot, I don't know. And in terms of currencies, what 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 uh, you know effect is this going to have in the fluctuation of currencies? And when can we see this kind of spiking? And 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 you know what can, what way do you see it going in that regard? I'm not a foreign exchange expert. I'll, I'll give you my tuppence worth. Um, Sterling has had a, a pretty good six weeks. That's mainly due to weakness in the euro and, and not anything to do with sterling itself. Um, a lot of the UK imports are from mainland Europe, so that's an, that's an important transaction. Uh, sterling has a, the elephant in the room for sterling is 31 December this year because there's a potential cliff edge. We, we, we haven't discussed Brexit much recently, but the government has until the end of next month, the end of June, to decide but they seek a formal extension to the Brexit talks and extend the transition period. Now, if they don't, then that means that come hell or high water, the UK um, transition yeah. period le uh, sorry, ends at the end of December. And that potentially means that um, there's a hard Brexit and that would be a significant um, negative for sterling and sterling would fall. Uh, un until then, euro weakness has kept sterling at a relatively stable level around 114 and a half on average for, for the last period of time. Uh, do dollar, it's weaker against the dollar. The dollar has strengthened for the last two or three months. It's almost like a safe haven. Um, and, uh, but that doesn't really have that much of an impact on, on uh, particularly construction companies in the UK. So I, I expect sterling will stay where it is, but then it's particularly the end of June, if there's no application to extend the transition period, I think sterling will weaken towards the end of the year because it just brings the, the, the hard Brexit um, into focus again. Okay, and another question um, I'd have for Irish companies, for instance, who are operating in the UK. You know, bearing in mind that there's a kind of different um, methodology in terms of what they've done over there uh, in terms of dealing with the, uh, the, the crisis. Um, when should an Irish company consider coming back into the market here and reinvesting and, and, um, and going for it again? Um, you know, are, are they, is it advisable to wait for another couple of months? Well, I think that any Irish company coming to the UK now that, that doesn't have a footprint here, then it's not going to be able to avail of any government supports. They're all targeted at, at existing resident companies and resident traders. I, I think, you know, the Irish construction sector is going to be particularly hurt, I think. Um, and so they will be looking back to the UK for people who either were here before or are exploring new opportunities. I think 
you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd keep my powder dry, I suppose, if I was an Irish construction company for a couple of months just to see what, um, how this plays out. Um, having said that, there's going to be an awful lot more activity in the UK from a construction point of view than there is in Ireland. I think Ireland is going to uh, suffer some pain. Because the supports in Ireland haven't been as generous as the UK. Um, they, they, they don't have the, the flexibility that the, that the UK have. They can't print, um, can't print their own money um, without the ECB consent. Um, but I think it's a sensible move. Again, go back to 2008, 9, 10. There was a significant influx when the construction sector collapsed in Ireland. The UK is, is you know, it's, it's a safety valve for, for the Irish uh, construction sector. And, and a lot of companies came back to the UK and they've done very well out of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the, to a degree foreign exchange plays a part in that, um, particularly if they're bringing over capital. Um, you know, they, they might be better bringing converting the euros into sterling in three or four months time, as opposed to now or the, or the next couple of months. I'd certainly wait till the end of June to see, to see what happens. But you know, from, from an opportunity point of view, there'll be more opportunities in the UK, that's for sure. Well, I'd like to, on that note, uh, thank you very much for your content today. Um, I'd also like to remind people that 10 years ago when we uh, set up BITA, um, probably nine years ago, um, we were, it was set up for that very reason. So if people do come over from Ireland, I would remind you that bit is well established now where it wasn't then. And we're able now to actually cope with that demand of people setting up contacts. So um, I'm going to get let my little speak in there and say that, you know, um, as an organization, we have fantastic contacts. And for anybody who is coming over from Ireland in that regard, seeking new opportunities, uh, the ITA is a good place to start. So thank you very much, Martin. And um, thank you all for joining us again. We hope to see you fairly soon on the platform. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.